Hello, fellow mutants. Today we're strapping ourselves in for a ride through the scorched landscapes of future past with the 1985 B-movie post-apocalyptic action movie, Wheels of Fire. I thought it might be fun to look back at movies like this one I never watched before and see what, if any, lessons might be gleaned like hidden gems for those prepping for a world after the apocalypse. Or if it's just all costumes and senseless fun. If you enjoy this video, throw a like my way and I'll do a few more. I certainly have a library to go through and look forward to it. Buckle up, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Welcome to Wheels of Fire by Filipino director Sirio H. Santiago. This film takes us on a journey through a world decimated by nuclear war, filled with ruthless warlords and, of course, tons of vehicular mayhem. Before we dig in, let's get the obvious out of the way. Just as some low-budget science fiction movies like Battle Beyond the Stars tried to cash in on the success of Star Wars at the peak of its popularity, a slew of post-apocalyptic movies came out resembling Mad Max the Road Warrior. In a way, we have Wheels of Fire and others like it to thank for building a new genre of film somewhere between science fiction and gang racing flicks, though the quality of a lot of these was and still be considered questionable. Some of these I've found to be quite fun, while others are best forgotten. So which camp does Wheels of Fire fall into? Well, oddly enough, someone felt this one was good enough to deserve to be in a double feature Blu-ray, and that's where it sits in my collection, having been recently obtained. So, on to the movie. Shortly after the credits, some uplifting theme music followed by some shots of a car very much like the one Mel Gibson drove in the Australian classic, Wheels of Fire launches into a rather lackluster gladiator pit-style fight in a nondescript part of some desert or perhaps nuclear wasteland of what was once a fertile land. My first thought at the fight, which reminded me of a choreographed Filipino stick fighting with metal pipes thing, was that this was supposed to be a very bad knockoff of the famous Thunderdome. However, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome was released on July 10th, 1985, while Wheels of Fire was released in March of 1985. Therefore, Wheels of Fire actually predated the release of Beyond Thunderdome. But that's only a minor win, if you can call it that. One-on-one -on -one fight scenes like this one were rather popular in the 70s and 80s, after all. And my martial arts instincts were spot on, because this film actually takes place in the Philippines, so... The fight appears to be choreographed with an actual Eskrima practitioner. Despite this bit of trivia, the first 25 minutes of the film I felt dragged on. Despite some clear effort put into the vehicle chases and scenes of gang mayhem and violence. The characters don't seem to have any real purpose other than to engage in a series of protracted shootouts, annoying interpersonal interactions between an overprotective brother and his sister's bad boy poor choice of a boyfriend, and chases. And some irony comes when the hero mentions that revving an engine once by his sister is wasting gas. After all, most of the movie has dozens of vehicles just tooling all over the place for minor acts of revenge. A lesson here from Copper Mutant, don't drive around aimlessly if gasoline is scarce, and don't waste gas going after a lone drifter with 20 cars and bikes. At this point, early in the movie, my hopes for an enjoyable watch were slim, since, as I mentioned, I'd never seen it before, and the plot seemed pretty weak. I was a bit too young at the time it was in theaters, a fact reinforced by some gratuitous nudity and a few scenes that revolve around non-consensual sex. Though they thankfully don't show it, if you're squeamish about this sort of thing, then this is where you may want to pass on the movie, since the references to it come back later. Of course, horrific acts are going to happen in any world without rule of law, and we should be mentally prepared for such eventuality, but this movie clearly dwells on it, just to get a few shots of boobs. As a side note, apparently the actress involved was a Playboy Playmate, 
and of course to rile up the hero for revenge. Again, in the beginning it felt like some kind of biker gang grindhouse movie for the first few scenes and then seemed as if it could have even possibly occurred in some remote desert location today with crazed bikers loyal to some local crime lord. Tarantino would have loved munching on popcorn watching this while chuckling. But at a point somewhere after 25 minutes, the tone shifted into something else quite different, and in my opinion, the movie improved along with it. I actually found myself liking some of the new characters introduced and caring what happened to them. More on that in a bit. Sort of the plot, it revolves around a stoic hero, Trace, played by Gary Watkins as he navigates a desolate world in search of a better life. Or something. It's not clear what he did before, but he appears on screen for the first time, head to toe in leather in a get-up pretty close to Mel Gibson's Mad Max. When his sister is captured by a local gang after hanging out too much with that real jerk of a boyfriend I mentioned before, Trace decides to confront the Wasteland Marauders to get her back. Watkins delivers a decent enough performance, in my opinion, having captured at least the grit and determination needed for survival in a harsh world, though his character makes a series of what I'd consider very questionable choices, at least if you want to live longer than the running duration of a movie. Stealth is really not Trace's strong suit. He sort of goes in guns and flamethrowers blazing, literally. The supporting cast, including Laura Banks, who plays Stinger, and Joe Avellana, who plays Scourge, were interesting enough to keep me watching. But what really makes this movie weird is the sort of borderline fantasy elements introduced. First off, there's the character Stinger I just mentioned. She has a hawk that I guess helps her, but she's no beastmaster because we don't see the bird do much for her. She stands out as a good actress with a decent character amongst a crowd of less impressive ones, however, so I found myself following her with interest and waiting for her next scene. Next there is Spike, another young woman in the movie who looks like she'd be more at home in the set of The Waltons, but apparently she's some kind of psychic mutant who can read minds. Then there are the Sand People, at least I think that's what they were called. They look a bit like Morlocks or Dark Elves and make the movie feel a bit more like Star Wars or a low-budget fantasy film than a realistic post-apocalyptic film, but given the endless scenes of biker guys with guns, it's actually a refreshing, if weird, diversion. There are even some Stone Age-type wastelanders briefly in one scene, perhaps the above-ground distant cousins of the primitive sand people since they have a similar hunched shuffle when they walk. Weirdness aside, Wheels of Fire does a decent job of creating a convincing post-apocalyptic setting on a limited budget. The barren landscapes, makeshift settlements, and souped-up vehicles contribute to the film's gritty and raw aesthetic. There's a bit where a group of kumbaya cultists are following a crazy man who intends to leave Earth on a homemade rocket ship. There is even a scene toward the end that has tons of extras engaged in all-out war. That scene, with military vehicles, mortars, and masses of fighters, was so impressive, in fact, that Roger Corman borrowed the same footage for another film several years later in the early 1990s. This other film, Raiders of the Sun, is actually also included on the same Blu-ray disc I have as a, the double feature. Watching them back-to-back, -back, it would be hard to miss the borrowed battle fo footage, since the uniforms worn are very easily identifiable as the same ones from Wheels of Fire, and unfortunately it seems they didn't try to explain it away by going for some kind of shared universe, though I've only watched a small amount of the next movie. No, they have some completely different identity despite the same uniforms and shared action scenes. After watching it, I didn't regret my life too much. I had a few good chuckles. I don't think I can share much in the way of survival lessons from having watched it. There was an interesting sub-story about how some factions were vying for control of the area, and one was in the process of kicking out the other. We don't often think about territorial disputes and needing to bow down to the latest warlord in our daily lives in a world with rule of law, but in a lawless landscape, what would you do to avoid being killed when the next gang takes over and rolls up to your home? It's an interesting thing to consider, at least, though the movie only sparked that notion in my head. Let's just say it doesn't end well for the hippie cultists. 
As far as survivalism goes, the characters never seem to be at much loss for food, water, ammunition, or gasoline for that matter. The biggest danger they faced was violence from roaming gangs and weird subterranean dwellers. So in this world, being good with firearms and vehicles seems to determine your likelihood for survival, which I suppose makes the title Wheels of Fire make sense. So my verdict, while it may not reinvent the wheel, pun intended, it delivers the goods for fans of B-movies, especially once you get past those first 20 minutes. If you're craving a dose of 80s apocalyptic goodness with a heavy side of schlocky costumes, some bad acting, and pointless vehicular mayhem, give this one a spin. Well, that's all I have for today, fellow mutants. Until next time, it's Copper Mutant, signing out. Thank you.